Well, good morning or good afternoon if you decide to watch this in the afternoon. Uh, today we're going to be covering 1 Kings uh, chapter 19 verses 1 to 8. Uh, but before we start, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open us in a word of prayer. Uh, so if you guys can join me. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for who you are and uh, your goodness, Father God, that you're uh, faithful to us even when we're not faithful, Lord. And I pray that as we come and, and, and study your word, Father God, that you remain faithful and instruct us lord in whatever word you have for us today and that you uh that you instruct those that are listening and and, and hearing this video father god uh, that you have a word for them lord and you instruct them in their hearts and in their lives in jesus name i pray amen so i'm gonna give you guys a quick recap of where we're at in first kings uh, so previously pastor dan was teaching and he went over uh some of the characters that we're gonna be covering and and one of them is uh Ahab. Ahab is uh, the current king of Israel. Uh, he married Jezebel, which is she's a queen or the daughter of uh, the king of Sidon. And out of that, he began to worship the kings of Sidon, uh, which is Baal. And so out of that, he, he began worshiping Baal and, and fell away from worshiping the Lord and, and following the instructions of the Lord. The second character is Elijah. He's the prophet of the Lord. He spoke to Ahab about the drought previously in the last chapter and he lived three years in obedience to the Lord in, in the wilderness in, in Sidon actually he he was there with a, a widow and, and the son and, and she uh, fed him and, and the Lord provided for them and and he raised back to life that son that had died and and now we are shown with another uh, oh uh, Elijah as well he, he had a showdown with uh, the prophets of Baal uh where he he told them you know like let's both build uh, altars and put uh an offering and let's see what the lord does and, and let's see what your god does and let's see what my uh god does and whoever responds and by fire burns the offering he is surely god and through this showdown it was basically Baal against the lord and he was the prophets of um Baal against elijah and elijah through a simple prayer he saw the power of God coming down on fire and burning uh, the, the altar. And, and from there, this is where we're picking up. And, and Jezebel is the character. She's the wife of uh, the king of Israel in the northern kingdom. Now the kingdom has been divided. And she worships Baal. And out of that worshiping of Baal, when uh, Ahab married her, Ahab as well started worshiping Baal. And she's also uh, one of those marriages where uh, kings used to marry uh, the daughter of another king. Uh, in order to have more more power or more control over an area. But in this case, it was not Israel who controlled Sidon, but it was more of Sidon and Jezebel who were controlling Israel, the northern kingdom. And so she had the pants in the relationship, if you would like to say that. Uh, and out of this, it influenced Ahab to start uh, worshiping Baal and, and the nation of Israel to start uh, building altars to, the Baal, to Baal and, and other gods. Uh, so we pick up in... 1 Kings 19, uh, and I'm going to read from verses 1 to 8. If you guys want to follow along at your homes, uh, in your Bibles, it says, Now Ahab told, told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent, her a, message, sent a message to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid, and arose and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, Arise, eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread and cake baked on hot stones, and a jar of water. So he ate and drank, and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time, and touched him, and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose, and ate, and drank, and went into the strength, uh, and went into the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. So we see this, this sense where, where Elijah has witnessed and he has seen the power of God coming down from heaven 
in fire, like burning the altar and burning the offering. And then he, he went and followed by killing the prophets. Um, and and he has seen all that and he told Ahab, go and, t and, tell, and tell the people, you know, go and eat. And, and out of this, in verse 1, we read, now Ahab told Jezebel. So what King Ahab does, he goes running to Jezebel and he, he tells her of everything that has happened. You know that the drought ended and that also all the prophets of Baal happened to be dead. And that in the showdown, a lot of people started admitting that the Lord was God. That the Lord, the God of Elijah, was the real God. And that Baal was not. So in this showdown, he proved a lot of things. And Ahab went, told them to Jezebel. And now Jezebel is going to respond with, with, with a message against Elijah. So the drought, it came about that maybe Jezebel thought, you know, the drought ended because of Baal. Maybe out of this, Baal was a victorious one. So she didn't find out about it until Jezebel came. And she was informed, and she recognizes that, you know what, we have failed. And out of this, she sends a declaration of war against not only Jehovah, which is God and the Lord, but against Elijah. And, and this is what she says. She's, then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So you see, not only did she send a proclamation that she was going to kill basically Elijah but but she was too smart for that she she knew that if she killed Elijah Elijah would die a martyr and the people would be like you know what we're still going to worship the Lord but she she was a strategist and she was a smart woman and in that sense she knew what she had to do to bring those people those people that had like fallen down and recognized that the Lord was God she knew what she had to do to bring him back and all that she had to do was discourage Elijah Make him fear, make him doubt for a second of the God that he's been obedient to this whole time. So out of this, she she went and challenged the life of Elijah. She told him that she was going to kill him. And out of this, Elijah just freaked out and ran. But before that, there's a quick story of a movie that's called Silence. Um, it's a great movie. It's about missionaries going out to Japan. And in Japan, there's a, there's this movement and it's... A, it's a movie that it tells you a lot of how people in Japan were refusing the gospel, but so many were actually taking it up. But the Japanese government found a way to stop that. And it was not out of making martyrs of the missionaries, but actually uh, discouraging them, you know, uh, and, and, and making them renounce their faith. They figured, you know, if these missionaries come and the local believers see them and they start following their God, if we if we kill him, we make it martyrs, and actually that will only attract more people and more people to this God, because that will show them that hey, these missionaries are not afraid of dying for the Lord, you know, or dying in the service of the Lord. That's how much they believe. So they figured when missionaries come, we'll grab them, and instead of you know just killing them, we'll torture them to the point where they can renounce their faith and renounce their God, and that will actually bring more discouragement not only in themselves, but in the people of God. That will only make him draw back. And this is Jezebel's strategy. She said, if I bring discouragement on Elijah and he just escapes, he goes and wanders off in the wilderness and, and, and he leaves, the people will start, you know, they, they, they admitted that the, that God was the Lord, but they won't have any instruction. They won't have anything to follow up with. And maybe they just go back to worship and bow, you know, even, even though they have seen the power of God defeat Baal. Um, so this was Jezebel's idea, and I think she succeeded pretty good, you know, and um, the opposition of, of Jezebel brought about weakness in, in Elijah's life. Not only had he had witnessed God's power in that mountain, you know, by seeing the burnt offering, seeing people proclaim the Lord to be God, and, and, and the, killing the prophets of Baal, you know, but he went from seeing the, uh, the power of God, demonstrating in that mountain in Mount Carmel to see an opposition and bringing about weakness. He brought about a, a weakness in his own life. Um, and let me read about that. And it says in verse 3, And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. So out of this, he brought a, a weakness that he isolated himself, you know. He, he just decided to run for his life. 
he decided that you know what no faith in god at this point and and the obedience for three years he actually left it behind and ran left the servant that was with him left him in Beersheba, and went into the wilderness maybe he was seeking another great moment of demonstration of god's power at a mountain that's what i would say that he was heading to to the mountain of the lord you know down in the south and maybe that's where he was heading but along the way he was weak and he saw his weakness and a quick example is that a lot of times when we see god's power right after that there's opposition and out of that opposition we are we fall into weakness and a lot of times we fall into weakness because we rely on our strength and in our strength when opposition comes he cannot prevail the opposition if we take our eyes off of jesus you know and in one of the, the examples i have a couple examples one of them is abraham abraham fled to egypt and failed at his faith and we know that his faith was his strength david he failed at his strength which was his integrity when he he committed sexual immorality with uh but sheba moses he was the meekest but he failed at that strength when out of a a, a rage you know and, and uh, going off on his temper he forfeited entering the promised land peter peter was a very courageous man a man that told jesus you know like i, I will die for you and when the time came his courage failed and he denied christ you know and then elijah he too was a courageous man we see this we see that he he three years he was obedient and he was out in the wilderness eating whatever he could depending on the lord you know the ravers ravens were feeding him he was getting uh drink from the water of the world you know and, and he was a courageous man going up to ahab and telling him hey bring about like the prophets and let's have a showdown and then he was courageous to stand there and being one against 450 and just trusting the lord in in that way that was a a courageous faith that he had but not only that he was courageous even to tell the people bring the prophets and let's kill him and his courage failed him when the opposition came it became a weakness his whole strength became a weakness and it was one of the reasons was because of un unmet expe expectations um let's let's follow up in, in verse uh four but i'm gonna read uh verse three again uh, start with verse three and he says and he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to judah and left his servant there but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said it is enough now O lord take my life for i am no better than my father's so he found out that he was no better than his father's he he saw that he had a lot of expectations maybe he expected out of seeing a demonstration of god's power for hundreds and thousands of people from israel just leaving everything behind and coming to to the lord you know uh, he expected maybe a revival a huge revival in the land of israel he might have expected peace in the opposition you know he didn't expect a message of retribution in opposition and, and ahab uh, and jezebel they actually didn't turn and worship Baal. Maybe that uh, worship the Lord. They actually continue worshiping Baal. Maybe that was one of the things that Elijah expected. Maybe the king and the queen will turn and start worshiping the Lord. But that also didn't happen. Instead, they actually went and, and, and wanted to like raise opposition against Elijah. So Elijah failed to continue to walk in obedience by faith, but be, began to walk by side, and that. And that brought about the fear that he was saying, you know, when he just wanted to his life to end. When he said, I failed. I'm no good than my fathers. You know, they failed as well to follow the, the, the Lord wholeheartedly. And out of this, he was exhausted. He was in distress. He was anxious. He was depressed. There was no hope. And, and, and that is where he was at. He was just telling the Lord, take my life. I'm no better than anyone else. And, and a quick word and i'm going to paraphrase what he said but it's spurgeon spurgeon said about elijah that elijah ran away from a defeated opponent Baal had been proven to be false Baal had lost and elijah ran away from a defeated opponent a lot of times in our lives out of our strength we are weak and our expectations are not met we're exhausted and distressed and we're just burned out and we run away from an opponent the enemy and sin 
when it's been defeated. We know that in the cross, death was defeated, sin was defeated, and it has no more power over us if, if Christ lives in us, you know? That sin cannot dwell and cannot conquer and, and live in our lives anymore, for we're slaves to righteousness now. And out of this, there are certain truths that we have to realize, that we, we, we have to turn our eyes to the Lord, and the Lord is to be the only person that we look to, and the only thing that we look to in, in moments of strength, but also in moments of weaknesses. Because out of every every uh, high, there's always a low. Out of every hill and great demonstration of God's power, there's always a position and there's always a valley following. And we have to be constant in knowing that big wins and big victories bring about opposition in our lives. And we are to expect opposition when big victories come. Because the enemy wants to to um, make us fear right after the the victory of God. Because if he makes us fear, he can he can actually bring bring us to tranquility and doubting the Lord. And a lot of the work that the Lord uh, did through through his demonstration of power can be tamed for a season, you know. And so we are to keep our eyes on the Lord no matter if we're in victory, getting to victory, or coming out of a victory, you know, or even if we're in the valley, like he was, you know, in the wilderness experience. We are to still trust in the Lord. And, and there's um there's uh, some truths that I wanna like talk to you guys about in this of how we can keep our eyes on the Lord and and, and what are we to focus on. And the first one is that He is good. And, and the Lord is good in the sense that He knows what we need. And let me let me finish off this this uh, the last three verses of uh, the last four verses of First Kings nineteen one through eight, and then I'll go ahead and touch up on them. It says, "He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat.' Then he looked, and behold, there was his bread ahead of a bread cake." on hot stones in a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. So first of all, we see that the Lord is good. Elijah was burned out. He had gone in a season of three years of ministry in great obedience. This powerful demonstration of of God's strength and power and then the opposition came at the weakest moment of Elijah right after the ministry Jezebel knew that that Elijah was weak and that's when the opposition came but the Lord is good in the senses that he knew Elijah need a rest that Elijah Elijah had done tremendous ministry and that he needed rest and one of the truths if you if you guys go to Matthew eleven twenty eight. One of the truths is that we know that the Lord knows what we need. And in that sense, is when Elijah was tired and there's exhaustion in our lives from great work that we've done for the Lord and the Lord has been doing through us. Uh, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, it says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord calls, you know, he knows that we are, we are prone to be exhausted, that there is exhaustion that we have in our bodies. And he says, come to me when that happens. Don't go off running, getting it somewhere else. But come to me, I will give you the rest. So we know that he's good in that sense. He gives rest to the weary. And the second one is that the Lord is our strength. We go to 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. And we know that the Lord, when our weakness, when our strength is becoming our weakness, because we have started to depend on ourselves, this is what the Lord says, and this is Paul speaking of his own weakness and what he found out through it. And he said, for the ministry of this service, I'm reading the wrong verse, definitely. Um, so it's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. It says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rest I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with my weakness, with insults, with distress, with persecution, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So in this sense, 
the Lord is good in that sense that He knows our weaknesses. He knows that at times those are our strengths, but if we tend to look at our strengths as 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 actually our own and not the object of our faith, you know, not knowing that those things are only perfected and they're only our strengths when we are looking at Jesus, they can become our weakness. But the Lord is good to know that out of those things, He shows us that His grace is sufficient. He shows us that even though we might be weak at times, His grace is sufficient to sustain us. That He doesn't have to make us kings and strong in every sense. That some of our weaknesses sometimes are our strengths when we are in grace. When we see it as God working in us. When that distress, that exhaustion, we see it as God, God's grace coming to teach us something. Um, the third object is that... Um, Sorry, I lost myself in the notes. It says, the Lord is our strength, and the Lord also knows what we need before we ask. If we go to Matthew 6, 8, many times we we don't even know what to pray for. Like Elijah, he was a man of prayer. He knew how to pray. He had been in constant communion with God, praying out of prayer is how the Lord answered in, in, in power, you know, burning the offering. And now he was praying uh, rather pretty selfish way and pretty distressed manner of Lord just take my life I'm no good I didn't do much I don't see the work done but the Lord knows what we need and he and Jesus is there praying for us and the spirit is telling us what to pray for but even then the Lord remains faithful when we're faithless and we are when we are unfaithful even though through this prayer Elijah prayed for the wrong thing the Lord knew exactly what he needed and he provided it so Matthew 6, um, 6, 8 says, So do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Before even Elijah knew that he was going to be weak, the Lord could already see that he was going to receive opposition and he was going to be weak and that he was going to need that time to rest. He was going to need that time in the wilderness to recover. Um, and not all that, we come to the second truth. He's our teacher. And what does this mean? Not only, when we study the Bible, not only do we say we learn the things from God, like these are teachings from God, but no, actually He's our teacher as well. He's not only teaching us the content of His Word and the content of who He is, but He's the one that instructs us in it. Even when we teach or we go to church, we are people that teach the Word of God, but it's, 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 it's God teaching it through us. If we teach it out of our own strength, and if I come trying to teach it out of my own strength, it would not prevail because I cannot teach you much. I don't have much to teach. Only the Lord that is teaching through me is, is it's, it's, it's enough to give you what you guys need. And out of that, we need to um, realize that the Lord is the subject of our teaching. He's the one teaching what we need. And, and if you guys can go to Psalm 25, this is recently what I've been reading. Um, and in Psalm 25, verses 8, to 12 we're going to be covering those um, he instructs those who fear him you know the, the Lord instructs those sinners who fear him there has to be a fear and reverence for the Lord for you to be a teacher you know the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord that is the sense first you must fear the Lord to become wise not in things of the earth but in things from God in things that come from him so uh, we read in, in verses 8 and 12, it says, God, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore He instructs sinners in the, way, in the way. And verse 12 says, Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct them in the way he should choose. So first of all, we got to be people who fear the Lord, who are in reverence of the Lord, who love the Lord in that sense, so the Lord can teach us, can instruct us. We can come in a humble manner, willing to learn. Second of all, teaching us His ways, which are righteous, truthful to our lives. You know, uh, let me read from verses 8 to 12 again. Um, and we'll see this, how, how the Lord doesn't instruct us in, in our own ways or in the ways of the world, but in His own ways. He instructs us about what He knows, out of what He is. That's why He guides us in that, because He knows those things are righteous. Those things are truth, and those things are are what prevails those things are what he we need because we need him so let me read it says um, psalm 25 verses 8 to 12 it says good and upright is the lord therefore he instructs sinners in the way he leads 
the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct them in the way he should choose. So not only the, the Lord teaches us his ways, and he teaches us out of who he is. He says, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. We know that the Lord is loving kindness. You know, he, he loves us with loving kindness. And he, he guides us in truth. And he is truth. And that is what he teaches. He doesn't teach some content that it's out of himself that he does not understand. Uh, but in this way, what he teaches us is, is not only truthful, but we are to get it as cognitive and practical, applicable. When he, when he teaches, it says that he instructs us in the way, but he leads us in it. We're not only to be hearers of the word, you know, when we hear it and we understand what faith, what grace, what, what having strength in the Lord and looking on him and having faith and not by sight, you know. A lot of times we by faith can trust, but our faith is on the wrong object. Our faith is not on the king, you know. He's not on the Lord. Our faith is more on our strength. Our, when our faith is on our strength, it becomes weakness, and we don't have. So the object of our faith is not to be put just on anything. It's to be put on the one thing that is truthful, and it has to be put on the Lord, the, who is good, who is our teacher, and He is our strength. Only when our faith is put on the right object does it actually prevail and strengthen us and give us all that we need to succeed, you know, and, and to be prosperous. Prosperous in, in, in understanding His his teachings and walking by them in obedience you know Elijah was a man who walked in obedience until for a time he failed to walk by faith but he started walking by sight he started looking at the things of of, of the people having come to uh, to to worship the Lord the nation hasn't just come and, and they haven't and Jezebel are still wanting to worship Baal and he was going by he, what he could see not by faith in God or what he had said you know just simply do this and do it at my word and if we walk in obedience we shouldn't fear even even when when it looks like things are not going our way and things are actually going the opposite way and there's a position if we walk in obedience we don't have anything to fear because we know that the lord is guarding us and he's he's protecting us you know if we walk in obedience we have nothing to fear second of all the lord barely lets us see what all of our good has done because we walk by faith and not by sight. Rarely will we be able to see right away the whole toil and work that we've been doing for the Lord. Because it's not for us that we do it. We do it for Him. Only He will show it to us, or even not to us, but to other people at the right time. So we are simply to be obedient to what He tells us, not wanting to see all the work. So that is that is the work for today. It's, it's people who are trusting and keeping their eyes on the Lord and, and relying on His goodness, who, Him being the instructor, the teacher, and knowing that He's our strength in weakness, you know? We walk by faith in these things, not by sight. Thank you guys, and I hope you guys can have a good week and catch up with this, and, and we'll, we'll see you guys later.